Well, all right. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey, Steve. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Ready for... Yes, yes, yes. I hear you fine. I'm excited. This is a pretty good topic. I, I definitely think it's an interesting topic in light of what we're experiencing right now. Um, I am going to go ahead and introduce our guest, um, and then, as always, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hey, Fatima. Hi, Dr. Guy. It's a lovely Resurrection Sunday, and I think it's that been. this is a perfect time for us to address this issue. Absolutely, and I'm so glad that you are feeling better this Resurrection Sunday. So uh, I yes. think that uh, this is a topic that is definitely right up your alley as a uh, uh, license as a marriage and family sorry as a marriage and family therapist. And so we have another uh, uh, psychotherapist on the show who deals a lot with couples. And so her name is Renee Greer. Hey, Renee. Hey, sweetie, thank you so much for inviting me, and let me just say thank you so much for um, coming on to the Zoom last night. I mean, you gave some really good feedback. You dropped lots of nuggets, and so just thank you for offering that uh, to the viewers, but I'm really glad to be here. Thank you, uh, Fatima and and MC, for for welcoming me here. Well, since you brought it up, because I was definitely going to mention it, um, last night, yeah. I think, was that the second one, Renee, that you did? That was the second <laughs> one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so Renee that, that is the second um, has one. been doing. Yeah. The, last night, okay. So Renee has been doing um, process groups online uh, with Zoom in light of COVID-19 and kind of helping people just process what it is that they're feeling, what they're going through. And last night was mm-hmm. really um, I, I thought was uh, I gained a lot of knowledge because there was a gentleman on there who had who had COVID nineteen and is doing much better since then. Um, but he just has an amazing story, and I think he's a pastor, right, Renee? He is. He's a pastor, um, and he is um, an advocate for for the black so community. Could, I mean, he's he's pretty well known. Mm hmm. You could hear it in his in his story that he was sharing um, with everyone mm-hmm. last night, and I, I just think it was so enlightening for us because um, even though I have always taken this very seriously since day one, I was thinking, right. well, they haven't showed any African Americans yet. Like I, I know we can all. Track it. <laughs> um, it's like I'm just I'm serious. I'm like you know I keep seeing people that don't look like me on TV who have it. Even though, again, right. I knew that it, it did not discriminate, but at that time, what they were showing were not people who looked like us. And so here we are, what is it, I don't even know the date, April April 12th, and we make up half of the cases of mm-hmm. individuals with COVID-19, black and brown people. And so um, that's really alarming um, that it's impacting us in, in such a way, and we kind of know some of those factors why it's impacting black and brown communities um, and hitting them harder than um, other communities. And so I think we might even be chiming in on some of that today. So if you guys are just tuning in, our topic um, this Sunday afternoon is uh, we're going to look at the increase in domestic violence cases that have really surged um, since the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we just kind of want to talk about what maybe some individuals are going through, um, and just how do you deal with maybe a domestic violence situation in general. Um, And so, you guys, anybody feel free to chime in. We've been talking about a lot of issues related to COVID-19 and people being safe and healthy. And so um, uh, a couple weeks ago we had Dr. Keely on, and she is a um, physician, and she really talked about how to – um, maintain ourselves physically, right, in dealing with COVID-19. Mm. And so um, today we're going to take a, a different spin um, from the medical perspective about staying safe and talk about domestic violence. So, you guys, what do you think is causing the increase during this particular time for domestic violence? You, Dr. Guy, you know, I actually was thinking about that, and I and I thought – um, that the, I don't think this pandemic is actually causing it more than it is exposing 
what was already mm-hmm. there in some in some cases. Because I think that uh-huh. um, in in most cases we are we have these opportunities to choose something else versus sitting and talking. And so we're, we're choosing that instead. Work, you know, going to the bar, hanging out with friends. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, how I would be talking about this topic. And when I thought about the word cause, I said, you know, I think that it's less about the cause and more about the fact that it's really just kind of exposing the elephant that, that in most cases, like I said, have always been there. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Definitely. It's always been there. Um, but Tina, what are your thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm going to say yes, I am. So I mm-hmm. think that what she says is definitely valid, that it is sort of exposing some underlying things that could have already been there or if there was already some type of violence or abuse, um, you know, this is just uh, hi- highlighting it that much more. But the and would be, I think that it is, it, there is a correlation between the virus and the increase in domestic violence because what we're seeing is because there are so many places where there are shelter-in-place orders, people are spending Mm -hmm. a lot more time together than they probably normally would because you have these buffers like going to work and going to school and other Mm -hmm. outside-the-home activities that people are not having an opportunity to engage in. People are losing Mm -hmm. their jobs, which is now increasing stress and anxiety because I'm concerned Mm -hmm. about how am I going to pay my bills? Where, you know, how am I going to make ends meet? Where is the money going to come from? So nothing uh, increases stress like monetary problems. So when you throw all of those things in the pot, you have a great Mm -hmm. mixture for um, something like domestic violence. And I want to be clear here, and I feel like it's important to state this, because we're using the phrase domestic violence, which is kind of broad, because I think that sometimes people use domestic violence interchangeably with intimate partner violence. So intimate partner violence is specifically talking about violence between spouses, uh, whether that's a heterosexual couple or a same-sex couple. Domestic violence is broad, so it could be intimate partner violence, but it could also be abuse of children or abuse of the elderly. And I think it's Uh important to highlight that because there's not just violence or abuse happening between people in intimate partner relationships. But there's also an increase in or the possibility of an increase in child situations or elderly abuse situations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Fatima. Um, I'm glad that you mentioned the difference between intimate violence and domestic violence and that this really is the umbrella from which all of those things can fall under and um, that those cases are, are not just between intimate relationships, but you have parents who are at home with their kids all day, and this is definitely not their norm. Mm -hmm. And so just with the amount of stress that they're under, um, they're responding to their kids by taking that aggression and frustration out on them. Or like you said, Mm -hmm. those who are taking care of elderly family members, again, everybody is just on edge um, as a result of this, and they're taking their frustrations out on the people who are around them, which obviously are, you know, close loved ones. Uh, Steve. What are your thoughts? Well, I do have to be the contrarian. Um, I think that there's always been a level of the domestic violence, but the increased reports would make me think these are the people that normally don't call the police. So I would think these mm-hmm. would be a lot more more new cases. Um, mm-hmm. And I think, like you said, COVID is just proximity and not having developed some of the tools in these relationships, whether they be intimate partner, whether it be, you know, caregiver or parent child that alleviate these situations from, from occurring. Mm-hmm. I tend to think this is a, a core of new cases than the ones that were 
not being reported. I still think those are still not being reported. I think the ones getting called to the police is this. This is the first time he done hit me, so I got to call the police. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. The first time my brother, right. you're right. Mama didn't hit me with the broom or something. So I'm leaning more toward these are first time cases, which are for the relationships that they've been in more outliers than the norm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And something I mentioned last night um, with you, uh, Renee, was this idea behind people not feeling like they have any control. And so Mm -hmm. um, when you think about someone who's an abuser, and I'm not talking about the the ones who are just starting, but if you're thinking about someone who's had a history of of abusing in the past, that had everything to do with their, you know, need to seek power and control. And so what is everyone dealing with right now? This feeling of not Mm -hmm. having any control, right? I I can't Mm -hmm. make the decision to leave my house when I want to or to go to work if I needed to, because my job isn't open or, you know, I can't pay my bills the way I would normally do. It normally do. And so for that person who abuses out of a lack, you know, who abuses because they need power, this definitely is a time where they're probably going to do whatever they can to gain that sense of power and control because everyone, I think, just at some point, some, you know, point throughout the week, you kind of have that sense of, hopelessness maybe, but more so helplessness mm-hmm. because I, I can't do anything. Like I can wash my hands and I can shelter in place and do all those things per se, but at the end of the day, even the most cautious person, you know, mm-hmm. can fall prey to COVID-19. So maybe that has something to do with it, um, that these individuals are just seeking to try to gain control back in a situation where they, they don't feel like they have any. <clears throat> I love what, what Steve said, and I absolutely agree. Um, I think we, when you put all of what we've already said together, I think we're talking about the fact that these, these are, in, in some cases, because some of, some of these uh, couples, it, it is new to these guys, whether it's physical abuse uh, or domestic violence. Um, but I think we're talking about uh, these are not really new cases, but, but different ways of behaving. Uh, like Steve uh-huh. said, you know, these guys probably go back and forth with each other, but then they have these other options, these other choices, like I was mentioning earlier, uh, where I will just decide to go to my mom's house. I'll talk to her about it. Or I will, there's all these other choices and things that uh, we can do. But like you're saying, you know, now maybe it's that um, I don't have those options, and so I'm losing control. And so, again, here's these new behaviors um, because I feel like I don't have the control to do the things that I would typically do. And so I, I absolutely think you're right. I think we are talking about a lack of control. Um, it's really hard for me to, to believe that, that the majority of these cases are people that have not experienced these type of issues before. Or maybe so, um, they've experienced um, other forms of abuse that wasn't physical. Exactly. And it's now right. escalated. To the physical side. Right. Yeah. And when I say exposure, you know, I'm thinking that, um, again, maybe this pandemic is, is, is exposing the fact that we, we really don't know how to communicate. We have no idea Absolutely. how to communicate. And because, again, you know, we had, we've always had these other options. Well, Absolutely. I, I like to jump in, and once again, I'm, I'm going to be the contrarian. Um, in relationships, because of the dynamic of the structure changing, sometimes you have to Uh change in the people. And if people don't have the tools they need, then sometimes those things can run awry. Like someone who was normally passive has started suddenly to be aggressive, and that might be met with another aggressive response. So I think it may go back to just like, in, in my opinion, there, there are, going to be a percentage of the cases are just because of the lack of being able to have these experiences and learn from them. Like I always, when we talk about domestic violence, I always like to reference the Chris Brown and Rihanna situation. Um, And it was terrible, but in the regard of Chris being a young male who wasn't mature and developed enough to Mm -hmm. actually Right decision. So I think in some places the case situations which are, are foreign territory 
and people are making bad decisions because they never were put in those situations to mature or grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have they have poor coping skills, or they don't have any coping skills at all, or the coping mechanisms that they had in place prior to these shelter in place, um, they can't mm-hmm. use them, or they don't have access to them anymore. So um, that may be definitely a factor. Uh, you know, well, they, Steve, you well, said something. Well, they have access to the weed and alcohol because those have been considered essential services, and I think that's one of the reasons why that they're still considered essential services because we all know those are very strong um, coping mechanisms. Mm-hmm. You know, well, you know, Steve, you, you just said two things. One, I'm going to go back to the aggressive, aggressive piece. Um, but before I do that, Fatima, were you getting ready to say something? I, I couldn't hear. Yeah, he um, he referenced Chris Brown, but I think it's important to say that more than anything, Chris Brown grew up in an abusive home. Like, he witnessed abuse in his home. And boys who witness domestic violence are twice as likely to abuse their own partners or even their children when they become adults. So I think that it's important to put that context in when we're talking about Chris Brown. Well, I think, honestly, it's important just to say that in general because – because people need to know and and parents need to know that if you're raising children and you're raising children in a home where there is abuse, be it physical, verbal, emotional, that your daughters are more likely to end up in a relationship where she will be abused and your son is more likely to become an abuser. Well, I was using Chris Brown as someone who has developed the proper tools no matter what his environment was. Uh, I agree with Fatima that that is definitely something that parents um, need to be um, considering while they're staying in these relationships um, because they will often sometimes say, I'm staying in this relationship because I have kids, even though Mm -hmm. it is an abusive relationship. And that can be extremely damaging from the children at their current state, but also later on in life is what you were talking about, Fatima. But I I wanted to go back to what you mentioned, Steve, that someone who found, you know, someone who was normally passive and now finds themselves being more aggressive or experiencing some type of aggression. And so what comes to mind to me is just the the grieving process. So Kubler-Ross talks about the stages of grief, and I think people are grieving, like they're grieving the loss of their old life. And so mm-hmm. grief looks very different depending on the phase that you're in. So, you know, there's the denial, bargaining, anger, depression, and then there's the acceptance. And so that person who was their um, norm or baseline was to be passive, they may be experiencing grief, whether it's because they lost their job or they've been impacted by COVID-19 in some other way because of a loved one. And so that could be the reason why we're seeing spikes and domestic violence as well as that people are just in their grieving stages at different levels. Um, and then the other thing you mentioned, Steve, the other thing you mentioned, Steve, was about the alcohol and drugs and that those are considered essential services. When you add in alcohol and any types of substances, we're just asking people to make bad decisions. And I think that's another reason why we're kind of seeing some of the behaviors that we're seeing because people are at home doing nothing other than maybe using those substances. So that could also well, I think it's interesting well. when we talk about the substances because would you get a better response if you cut them off greater of them not being able to self-medicate? Well, I, I, to say would they be better or not? Well, I was just talking about would you would you prefer to cut off the people who are dependent on alcohol and marijuana for that marriage to see do you think there would be a better response towards the numbers of domestic violence if they did not have access? 
When Naya and Fatima take a shot, mm-hmm. I got to sit with that's that a one difficult, minute. That's a difficult question <laughs> to answer because if you're, if you're talking about dependency, well, we know that if somebody is dependent on alcohol in particular, it's very dangerous just to cut them off cold turkey. That, that could actually end up killing them. So that's a, that's a difficult question to answer because you use the word if they're dependent on it. Now, if this is someone who, um, like, just maybe uh, occasionally binge drinks or um, something like that, that would be a little different. But I have to agree, anytime you're adding substances to a situation, especially an already heightened situation, I don't think that it does any positive or, or anything good. I think it usually ends up for going toward the bad more than likely. And I'm sure, and um, hopefully I can get the numbers on that during this show, but I, I'm sure there's probably some research out there about um, alcohol being uh, involved or a, a variable in some of these domestic violence situations. Mm-hmm. I, I was just kind of curious because I, I know Dr. Guy and Fatima, you all don't consume alcohol. So I was interested in your perspective. <laughs> I think what's really interesting is that uh, you were talking about control earlier, uh, Dr. Guy, and um, I think mm-hmm. this is one way that some people are maintaining control. And so I, I don't think it would be a good idea, like, if, you know, we did not consider um, alcohol essential, I think the numbers would probably be a lot higher because this is at least one form of control that um, a lot of us are using at the moment. Now, is it good? No, but, and, you know, it is what it is. It's the reality of it. Mm-hmm. Right, you but guys, that's I'm like gonna... somebody who comes home from a stressful day at work and has a glass of wine. Mm-hmm. That's a different right. than somebody who is, like, really – seriously self-medicating by like binge drinking. So, and, and I think it's important to talk about this because a lot of people don't know this, but for in, anyone, and, and it's broken down between men and women, but if you are a woman, you shouldn't be consuming more than seven drinks in a one week period. Anything above that is considered alcohol abuse. So, well, and I think that, that would, I think that would, that would, you know, in in this situation that we're in, and and it's such a precedented situation um, that I don't think any of us really know how to the best way, the best way, right? But I think that what you're saying um, really makes a lot of sense, and I think we could use that in um, in in like the regular situations. But I think again, in this situation, and just speaking about like if we were, you know. Would there be some type of correlation between alcohol not being essential and the spike or the numbers and the and uh, physical abuse or domestic violence at the moment? The moment I think it would be, uh, like I said, because I think that um, unfortunately, it's just, like I said, it's not good, but I think it is at least some form of control. And again, I'm just speaking about um, the the control aspect. I, I don't think that's the way to cope. Mm-hmm. I don't think that's the best way to ever cope. But in this situation. Uh, I think people are grasping for straws, and I think that, uh, like Steve said, maybe that's why it is essential because that is you take that away, and mm-hmm. we may see some some astronomical numbers, maybe. And I, I I definitely agree with that, Renee. That we're not saying that obviously we want individuals who are abusing alcohol to continue to abuse it, but what we no. do know is that people drink and they respond differently, right? So you have the person who drinks and they pass it out like that's it. You have the person that right. drinks and it just chills them out and then you have the person that drinks and gets aggressive. And so to consider alcohol non essential for in anyone, I think that that would be damaging. But even for people that are social drinkers, right? Like even for I think mm-hmm. about my clients, my clients are like, oh, I, you know, I've noticed that I've had a glass maybe more or two than I used to of wine before COVA because it's it's helping to relax them. Now, they're not abusing mm-hmm. it, but they have noticed that they've increased it. And so to eliminate it completely, I don't think that that would be the answer because people respond to Mm-mm. alcohol in so many different ways. Um, but I, I definitely think that it's 
it's one of those contributing factors. It's a correlation to some of the instances of domestic violence. But we have uh, Dr. Malik who is calling in, and so I think he has an interesting statement that he wants to make. Um, so we're going to get him on the air. Hello, Dr. Malik Rahim. Hello, how are you? Um, I'm good. I'm sorry I joined a little late. Um, but the, uh, what I did here was very, very, very interesting. But I think you're missing, you know, from what I heard, an important um, part of the equation. That's a woman. The research shows that women are more likely to initiate domestic violence or emit, uh, intimate partner uh-huh. violence. They're more, they're more uh-huh. likely to initiate it, either physically, psychologically, or emotionally. Now, what uh-huh. a lot of times happens is the male will respond, and the woman is more likely to be injured or killed in those altercations. So, That's like, good. sometimes as, as clinicians, we can't, you know, solely make domestic violence just a female as far as victim issue. There are lots uh-huh. of males that have involved as victims in intimate violence and domestic violence situations that don't get reported because uh-huh. a woman, a lot of times, she initiated either psychologically, physically, or emotionally. Um, as far as the alcohol variable, I, I love what you all are saying, but the thing is, is unfortunately, the way I look at it is we have to look at the the structural reasons on why domestic violence is happening. And some of you all bring it up as far as communication. Some of you all have brought it up as far as multi-generational trauma that's going on, as far as being raised and being taught that these are the things that are happening. I mean, it's just something as simple as, getting a spanking. The thing about it is uh-huh. sometimes you got to understand psychologically what a, a message a spanking gives. It gives that someone does not do something that you want. You are okay to use physical deterrence to get them to behave the way you want. And that internalized message can last on for years in a person's mind. Okay, so it's like the thing is, like, there's a lot of structural issues. Now, of course, alcohol and drugs, like you all said, do contribute and let go of your inhibitions. But I think it's very, very important that when we're discussing intimate partner violence or domestic violence, we understand that it goes on both ends. That even mm-hmm. with the Chris Brown and um, Rihanna situation, it was reported that Rihanna started physically attacking him. And that does not justify what he did. But it doesn't uh-huh. justify what she did either. So the thing is, is like, but see, the thing is, because of the way society is, a lot of times males are looked at as the bad guy and the victim, uh, perpetrator all the time, when in actuality research shows that women usually initiate it. But unfortunately, because of the male's physical strength and because a lot of times the explosive temper the man might have, the woman is more likely to be injured or killed. Now, we have a lot I'm sorry, of people say that research Can I shows that question? women usually initiate yes. the violence. Yes. What? Can, yes. can you please direct me to that research that it says that women are more likely to initiate the yes, violence? I sure can. I'm I not sure aware can. of that. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you if you look up if you look up Dr. Esther Jenkins, um, a, a social psychologist recently retired from Chicago State, she did a extensive research on this. Dr. Carl Bell mm-hmm. also did extensive yeah. research on this. So the thing is... Dr. Esther Lincoln? Yes, and Dr. Carl Bell. If you look them up, you'll see his extensive research. If you have... So, like, the thing is, like, if you even do... If you even go to different studies that was done by the... Um, Dr. Rahim, can I ask a question, though? Yes. The, uh, because this... Our show in general today is just about domestic violence, but by no means um, were we imp- at least at least I don't I don't remember hearing it that we were implying that women are the the um, always the ones who are being abused, yeah, and that women are like that. that. Even be, right, that was not our. We didn't imply that because even before the show, right, right. we were like talking said, about how like same sex relationships have high domestic violence rates, um, exactly. whether it's male exactly. or women. Like, and so, I sincerely apologize if I misinterpreted your show. 
But I, like I said, I joined oh, yeah. late. And I, I came in just as um, I believe um, Brother oh, Steve was talking about yeah. the Rihanna situation That's and it. then the, the question about alcohol. So like I said, I came okay. in late. I, I, I sincerely apologize if, if I misrepresented your all show and what you all were saying. But I think this is a very, very powerful and important topic to be had. And uh, mm-hmm. like needs to be done on this very, very much. Well, you know, I think Dr. Uh, Raheem is highlighting a segment of the overall, I guess, mm-hmm. the concept of domestic violence. Um, and I think it's important to also note, and I think this is probably what the research is stating, generally speaking, women tend to be more mentally or I mean, emotionally abusive, whereas men are more physically abusive. So what we end up quantifying because of the the violence associated with the physical abuse is there was never a precipitating cause of physical, of emotional, or psychological abuse. You know, like we always talk about on the show in relationships, you need to learn how to fight fair. If I got three toes, you can't call me a three toes. It has nothing to do with the mm-hmm. argument when I the toilet seat up or not. <laughs> See, we're getting some feedback when you're talking. It's a little difficult to hear you. Hello, is that better? Oh. Say something again, Steve. But I did not want to be interrupting your show. I thought you all were having a great conversation. I was really, no, truly really enjoying it. So you did I'm not interrupt us. Again. I always enjoy your well, feedback. I definitely do. But wait, don't go because well, I'm actually about to yeah. ask some questions, and <laughs> you can chime in here. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to let you get off the hook that easy. So, you guys, because obviously we're saying that there's multiple reasons why we might be seeing this surge in domestic violence, I I just want to spend a little time talking about, uh, and Fatim, I think you kind of started it off, spend a little time talking about what does domestic violence look like, and specifically let's look at um, intimate partner uh, violence. So I just kind of want to spend a little time talking about that. So all of you all are clinicians, so definitely feel free to chime in. Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? I I want us to specifically talk about what intimate violence is, right, because we're talking about domestic violence, which could be for children, elderly, or romantic relationships or intimate relationships. But I want to talk about specifically what is that? What does that look like? What is it? Okay, so that's what so I'm asking about. So, intimate partner violence. Intimate partner violence. It can look like a wide range of things. So it can be physical, verbal, emotional. It could be economic, right? Somebody who, like, if you you have in your relationship, you have no control or no say over finances, or the person is controlling you through finances. It, um, it can be sexual abuse. Um, it can be um, uh, um, well, that that will fall under sexual abuse because a lot of people don't think that um, that that rape can happen in in marriage, and that's untrue. Rape can and does mm-hmm. happen in marriage. Um, so it, it can look like a variety of things, and quite often what happens is people will think, well, I'm not being pushed down the stairs. So here, there's, there's no domestic violence in my relationship. Well, you're not being pushed down the stairs, but this person has isolated you away from all your family and friends. So, you're, you know, you don't, you don't communicate with any of your friends and your family because that makes them upset. Or maybe they talk to you really poorly and, and curse you out all the time and, you know, just assault you with their words. Those are all intimate partner violence situations. Um, uh-huh. And so I think that it's important that we not just look at it as physical abuse, 
because there are more people in these types of relationships than uh, people than you realize. Um, I do want to um, say something about the numbers, though. So if we're thinking about broad, right, so not just physical violence, 85% um, of domestic violence victims are women, so that means that 15% are men. Um, I agree those numbers probably are a little higher for men, but the reason why we don't know that is because of that phrase that nobody likes to use except me, toxic masculinity. I think one of the primary reasons why many men don't report is because of toxic masculinity. Because if I'm a man, I'm not supposed to say that, you know, the, this woman is beating me up or treating me very poorly or controlling me through finances. And so right. because Can I somehow say to that? that, that uh, let me Can finish I say because somehow, uh, let me finish because somehow that would suggest that I'm less than a man. And so sometimes many men don't report because of that because they're afraid that it would somehow threaten or call into question their manhood. Okay, okay. I'm done. Okay, now, Lenny, but you also got to look at the fact of this. While you are right that many men might not report because it might make them, in their mind, look bad, you also got to understand the way society looks at the whole situation of domestic violence and intimate partner violence. It is much, much harder for a male to call a report a woman beating her, him, than a woman calling. As society, we look at the fact that if a man calls, it's less likely that woman to go to jail. Until recently, it was less likely for that woman to go to jail or be charged with abuse. I'm glad you so said it's until recently so because women absolutely go to jail because of abuse. But See, if you're going to say it, until recently, is, that's beautiful. But you, I let you finish. You're not letting me finish. The thing about it is this. So it's like you got to look at when them numbers were accumulated. So even now, it's also about what being reported. So you got to be real careful when you're throwing out stats because you even mm -hmm. put a, a, new, a, a nuance on the stats that a lot of men are probably not reporting it, and they're probably living in silence. I wouldn't necessarily call it toxic masculinity. I would call it trauma because they're still living in silence. And as a clinician, uh -huh. I wouldn't put a term on it where I'm blaming the male. I'll put a term on it where I'm blaming society. Because you got to look at mm -hmm. the structural issues of the way the male has been conditioned to think on how he's supposed to behave and the way the society thinks the male is supposed to behave. So the thing about it mm -hmm. is this. When you report those numbers, be real careful that those numbers are actually, actually reflecting everything that's going on. Because like you just said, males might be under-reporting for a particular reason. So when you say 80% or 85% are women, and 15% males try to say, well, more women are being victims. More women are getting injured or being killed. I've already said that. But that don't mean that they're not initiating it. Okay, you know I'm what? sorry. I want to First jump in all, for it. No, wait, 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 because I never, ever, ever said that more women are being abused and not reporting. I said that probably more men are being abused and not reporting. And I can be very clear about where my facts come from. So if you look up assessing risk factors for intimate partner homicide in the 2015, in the, uh, in, in the March 2015 issue, journal number 250, you can find these statistics. If you look up intimate partner violence in the Bureau of Justice Statistics, you can find these stats. Now, I asked you, where did your stats come from, sir? And you gave me a list of names of people to look up. So you be clear with your statistics, because if it's one thing about me, I always back up my stats with an accurate citation. I'm not here to go back and forth, but you already said that more men probably are not reporting it. So it's already showing those stats are probably skewed. So if more men are not reporting that they're, uh, they're victims of uh, intimate partner violence or domestic violence, it's already showing that those numbers are probably skewed. That's all I'm saying. You said that yourself. I said it's my opinion that those numbers are probably higher because 
we assume that many men are maybe not reporting. But the numbers that we have, these are the numbers we have. So I'm giving my opinion based on this statistical data. You also I, and, not- I, and I, I'm not really sure what the agenda is that you're trying to get at. Hold that thought because I, that I a think male, I'm that a all male, of that. That, guys. Men, that men can be victims of domestic violence. That's my agenda. Because if we do not do make that clear, you both we can have thing? a lot of brothers do, suffer. Do right, right. Well, absolutely. That's, I, my... that's why I'm saying I'm not sure. So, Fatima and Dr. Rahim are both saying the same thing. I'm not sure if they hear that they're saying the same thing. So, Renee, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. Uh, you know, I, 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 I well, was trying well, to say something, but you couldn't get chimed in. Well, I actually forgot what I was going to say. I got caught up in the, in the whole ordeal, but uh, wow. You know, I think you're right. I think both these guys are saying the same thing. I, I will have to agree with Dr. Rahim, though. You know, my experience sitting in the office is that um, I've had to uh, actually make it real clear for my men that what you're experiencing is abuse, right? Because uh-huh. I don't know if I would go and lean on the side of uh, time more than I will uh, the fact that these guys really just don't know. They have no idea uh, that, that it's abuse, right? Even if it's just emotional uh-huh. abuse. For instance, uh, I have a client that I've been working with for a while, and, and his his wife, you know, has this, this thought that, you know, he needs to read my mind. He needs to read my mind and he needs to get it right. And he needs to get it right the first time. And if he doesn't, then she kind of punishes him, right, uh, because he didn't clearly read her mind, right? And so then she goes into um, a lot of what uh, Gottman calls the four horsemen. Like she gets re- very, very critical, very critical. She used a lot of contentment and she uh, stonewalls, you know. And so then he, he's very confused at this point. Like he doesn't know what the hell is going on. And so he's, after really looking at this and, and, and looking at the cycle of abuse, um, we have these moments where it, it's very, very tense. And, and this is where she's saying, what am I asking of you? What am I asking for you to do? Tell me. Let me know. Tell me what it is. And he has no idea. He has absolutely no idea, but it gets to this point where she's tearing him down verbally and emotionally, and, and she thinks that it's because, uh, or she has the right to do it because I'm a woman, and, and he should just know, damn it, he should know what it is that I want. And so typically when I get these men alone, uh, some of them, uh, I, do, I have to be the one to make it very clear to these guys that what you're experiencing is abuse. So I don't think it, it – sometimes, I will agree with, with the team of that sometimes I think it's the manhood um, that, that stops them from making phone calls or telling anyone about it. But I can tell you just based off of my experience, it's the, the, really the, the, um, the issue is that these guys are experiencing it but calling it something different. Uh-huh. You know what, Renee? I'm going to um, jump to Steve because this is your term that you often use, Steve. So um, emotional terrors, and he talks <laughs> about exactly, exactly. He talks about women who are in these relationships, and they are emotional terrors. And even though they may That's not be a good word their for hands, it. yeah, they're you know they're just cutting men up. And so, Steve, I'm gonna let you talk more about your term, emotional terrors, when it comes to women in these relationships and well, how they might be well, I'm sure affecting this. men. I'm sure this probably won't sit well with Fatima, but I will go ahead and say these things anyway. Um, I do have the privilege of having a, a, a real close friend who is a police officer, and, you know, for his first couple of years on the force, we would kind of go over some of the things that he would encounter. And generally speaking, we would look at a lot of his domestic violence calls, and we could identify when, quote, unquote, it went left. And a lot of those things were as um, the the panelists have stated, when there was some significant emotional or mental abuse. And that's when things became physical because the man 
in this particular situation didn't have the mental wherewithal to go back and forth mm-hmm. with the woman. So he just struck out what which was natural to him, which was something physical. And I think what I was saying earlier is we tend to quantify domestic violence when the police are involved and it's quote unquote charted as in a domestic violence situation or call. But what has happened over time is that there have been some women that have uh, like the panelists stated, haven't been made aware of their power as women in their words and deeds um, to become emotionally abusive or terrorist. So you have a lot of these men that are dealing with uh, women that can be inconsistent, and that becomes confusing to the man. And a lot of times what happens is the man will withdraw but the woman will follow and instigate a confrontation. And, you know, like I tell everybody, you know, when you're in the cage with the lion, you can't really go poke him because you're going to get a predator response. So a lot of times Mm -hmm. what happens is because these women think, well, I'm a woman, you can't hit me. You know, they feel Mm -hmm. like they have these type of privileges. They prod the man until the point that he is not able to withstand the emotional abuse. And I've been in some of these situations as well with with women that have have, uh, put their hands on me and gone above and beyond what I thought was acceptable behavior. And I didn't report it. It's not because I'm toxically masculine. It's just because I didn't see no need for us to have anything on her record or my record when it was something that was a learning experience for both of us. You know, I I like what what you're saying, Steve. And I'm going to tell you, you know, when we are in the office with a couple uh, typically, whatever's, ha- whatever's happening at home will show up in the office. Um, uh-huh. I have experience with working with my couples uh, that the women, if, 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 I, if I allow it, you know, they would become very emotionally abusive with me. And so that's when I have to, this is a great opportunity now, uh, Dr. Guy, where we can show these guys how to maneuver in such a situation, because I think what Steve said is, is, is absolutely true. Like the guys become gridlocked because I don't know what to do in this situation uh-huh. where uh, she's ex- having these expectations of me. I'm not really sure where to go emotionally with this because most guys don't. They don't have the emotional uh, intelligence or, or wherewithal. Um, but, but I've had those experiences where uh, the females are, are not listening. That's number one, and I say it quite often, and I have to tell most of my female clients that you're not good at listening because that's not what he's saying, right? And so we, we again, have to take an opportunity where we can uh, really break down the conversation uh, so both guys, for one, are having an opportunity to speak and, and also be heard. Um, but I've had these experiences where the, the women are um, – doing all that they can to try to really break me down in the session, you know, even criticize me uh, because they're not getting what they want. Uh Or I'm Uh letting them, you know, I'm I'm kind of giving back to them, okay, this is what I think I'm hearing you say, or or, are you hearing what I'm, and the women are, I'll ask uh, Dr. Guy, you know, so what did you hear me say, actually, you know, speaking to the women? And they keep telling me what they feel. Well, no, I want you to talk to me about what, you, what you're hearing me say because I had one time mm-hmm. you, you called me weak, and, and that's absolutely not what I said. But uh, this goes back to trauma when, you know, when she was younger and, and she felt like people were calling her very, very weak, um, and, and she, and she um, uh, didn't have enough strength to protect herself when someone was trying to molest her, you know, all these types of situations. But she bring in, she's bringing these past situations to, to the moment with me, right? And so she's uh-huh. telling me that what I said to her is that she was weak. And so that's exactly the same type of situations that happen at home, but there's no mediator, there's no coach, there's no therapist there uh, to make sure that, um, no, 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 ma'am, you gotta listen to, you got to listen to what he's saying. I don't want you to, to be in this conversation and just keep striking out because of how you feel about what he said. I want you to listen and really hear what he's saying, and then we can respond. Again, going back to the Gottman approach, but I, I, I don't believe that um, a lot of, well, I'll say this, in my experience, most, if not, well, mo, I'll say most, that the, uh, of the couples that I've worked with, 
if there was some type of emotional abuse, it was coming from the woman. Mm-hmm. And I, I think also that's and, kind of what I was saying with my, my friend is that when we sit down and, we, you know, we would look at the cases that you would get called on domestic violence, we could clearly say in about 70 to 75 percent of the cases there was a point at which, you know, there was either aggression from the woman or there was mm-hmm. some type of challenge that probably shouldn't have been issued. You know, well, you ain't going to do that because you ain't a man, and such and such and such and such, you know. And, you know, after a while, you know, when we have that, that loss of respect in the in the relationship, either it's going mm-hmm. to be aborted or relate, or respect is going to be established. And generally, respect is established through physical confrontations. Mm-hmm. You guys, it's so true. <clears throat> this is a time where most people are um, dealing with two types of situations. Either one, and, and Renee, you mentioned this one yesterday, is that individuals are um, quarantining by themselves and they don't have anybody. And so that's a whole mm-hmm. different set of issues that that person is going through. And then the other uh, population are the people that are in relationships, whether they be married, you know, just living there, whatever the case may be, and they're living with a mate during these times where they're being quarantined. And tensions are high, right, especially – if these individuals have been laid off or um, mm-hmm. maybe they're working from home, their kids are home. And so what is it? Is it the the time that people are spending together that is increasing a lot of these tensions? And because couples typically just don't communicate well anyway before COVID-19, mm-hmm. they're not communicating well. So what is it that mm-hmm. couples can begin to do because we might be in this another month, another two months, another six months. So what is it that we can say to speak to couples? And, and this is open to everybody, you guys. How can couples improve their current style of communicating um, so that these tensions can begin to decrease so that we're not continuing to see a flare-up of this aggression, whether it be physical or emotional? I don't know. You know, I think, like, having the con- um, and, and you're right. I, I, I said that earlier that I, I feel like this is really exposing the fact that we don't know how to communicate. Or it could be exposing the fact that I don't like you. I love you, but, but I don't like you. Mm-hmm. You know, and I didn't realize that um, because I've, I've always made the other choice to go to do something else. But I, I feel like in, in these situations, um, because we know tensions are high, uh, I always say this, and, and I feel like it's just, what's necessary. Um, you got to be honest with yourself first. Like when you know that I'm not happy, I'm not, of course, happy with the situation with the quarantining, but I'm not happy with the way that we are communicating. I'm not, this doesn't make me feel good. This doesn't make me feel better. Um, I, I need to own that first, right? And then after I own that and I can say, I need to talk to this guy because this is not okay. Uh, then you go to that person and you say, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about some things. Is this a good time to talk to you about it? And, and if not, um, when and how do you want to have this conversation? I know it sounds corny, but at least being able to know, uh, for instance, in the morning, I don't want to talk about it. When Right when I come home from work, I don't want to talk about it. So having the conversation about um, what, what and how we need to have this conversation, I think it's really important because, again, a lot of these guys are going to be talking about things that they've never talked about before. Some of these couples have never mm-hmm. had to talk about finances. So this is all very new. Right. So sitting down and saying to each other, um, I'm noticing some things, and, and I do think that we need to talk. How, husband, do you want me to ask these questions? Uh, do, you, uh, do you want to, I don't know, do it over dinner? Do you want to make sure that you, after the children go to sleep? Do you think we should uh-huh. maybe set up something uh, every day, uh, an hour in the day where you and I uh, can have this conversation? But really sitting down with each other, first of all, like I said, being honest with yourself that I'm not okay in this relationship, and then going to the other person. And I think it's important to say that because a lot of the times uh, we'll feel something very strongly and we won't say anything because we don't want to rock the boat. Well, but the problem is, uh-huh. although you hadn't said it, it's very much so a part of the relationship because it's going to show up in your behaviors, whether you're stonewalling, walking around, slamming stuff, uh, or whatever you're doing. It's going to show up in your behavior. So just go ahead and be honest with yourself and say, look, I don't like the way this feels. I've got to be honest with myself about it. 
then I'm going to the, the other person and saying, uh, hey, there's a conversation that needs to be had. How and when uh, would you like to do this? So really mm-hmm. having a, the conversation about how to conversate because most of us don't mm-hmm. All right. um, always, I would uh, like to kind of say something real quick. Oh, Dr. Mike, you still hanging quick. around, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, I like I like what um I heard from Steve. The only thing only only thing is being a Muslim, the whole emotional terrorist kind of scares me. Hey man, they out here, bro. Muslim Muslim <laughs> terrorists get it. <laughs> man, Muslim, um, Muslim, Muslim. African American, <laughs> Indian, no. they out here, brother. No, as, as Muslims, we often call terrorists. So that Muslim that it is emotional terrorist. You know, that's hey, I'm, I'm sure there are a couple of sisters in the mosque that are going to give you a run for your money. <laughs> yeah, okay. But, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm positive it is. But um, I like, I really, I really like what um, Sister Greer was saying, not only on the broadcast last night, but what she's saying today. And the thing is, what she said last night is a lot of times we're, we're, we're you know, we're quarantining isolated we're alone but sometimes we're quarantining with someone alone because we don't even mm-hmm. know who we are right, That's right. Uh-huh. and so uh-huh. and so it's like a lot of times we associate our identity with either that relationship our career our degrees and this is Absolutely. a trying time and it's a trying time and a lot of times we go through that and it puts a lot of strain on our relationship we a lot of times we think we know a person but we don't even know mm-hmm. ourselves and then we then like when the world was quote unquote normal, we were leaving. We were separating from each other for certain periods of time. Mm-hmm. A lot of time. Not all the time. Right. I don't know everybody's situation. But a lot of time we were separating. Now we're kinda like there together. So now all of a sudden you know how mm-hmm. much this person breathes. You're sitting there counting every breath this person takes and you're you're that's aggravating you because you're already frustrated. The stress levels are high on you because you're unsure and you're unsure on who you are. So I love the things that she said about knowing enough about yourself when you can walk away and knowing enough to ask that person, when can we talk about this? I think communication is beautiful. Um, I think that individuals, if they're having issues, they should seek out counselors like Dr. Guy, like um, Sister Greer. I think they should seek out counselors. No, and, no, and, no. No, because I don't do couples counseling. I <laughs> I, I'm not that patient. <laughs> I'm not that patient because because the thing about it is you've got to be really patient. Just like um, Sister Greer was saying, sometimes you get scapegoated and blamed as the counselor. Uh-huh. When one person feels that you are you know siding uh-huh. with the other person when they feel that you should be siding with them, you know, <laughs> and yeah. they'll they'll project things off onto you that's not even true. That that's really you know things that they're dealing with. So it's like, uh-huh. so I, I, I have, I, I don't like doing couples counseling, but I, I, I honor the people who do couples counseling. That That's a, a skill level. I teach it in college, but I will, I don't like to partake in it. But I think the the beautiful thing is, is the both what um, Brother Steve said and what Sister Greer said was, was on point that it's like, there's a lot of time that there's a lot of emotional abuse that turns into physical abuse because the person don't know how to react, don't know how to communicate. And it, it's the same. I think counseling is extremely important. I think communication is important. Um, learning certain, certain things about yourself and your partner on, you know, and setting up a time when you two can sit down and communicate about different things. Mm-hmm. Because like Sister Greer said, it's like a lot of times people never talked about uh, finances. They never talk about finances, and they, then it's like depending on how they identify themselves, they might identify themselves as the breadwinner, and these are scary times, and they frustrate. They don't have the emotional intelligence to really communicate what's going on with them, and they explode and go off on a person. So I think um, these are some very, very trying and difficult times, but I think um, um, Sister Greer said it beautifully that a lot of times we don't know ourselves, and we don't even know our partner. And we end up, even though we're in the same room with each other, sometimes we're all alone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to, to piggyback on that, the whole when to have a conversation, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you both mentioned that because 
it's not always the right time to have a conversation with your mate when you want to have it. And and that's something that comes up in the couple session is that one mate might need time to process the situation or think about it or they're just not in the right hit hit state to to talk and the mm-hmm. other mate wants to force them to talk right now because I want to talk about it and it's important to me. But I, I think it is important for couples to understand that your mate needs to be ready to have that conversation. Now that doesn't mean always run away from it, but give your mate the opportunity to say, this is a good time for me to have this discussion with you. And that seems to not have happen um, in a lot of relationships because people want to talk when they want to talk, uh, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Fatima, what are your thoughts? Um, Fatima? I, I don't. Hello? Hello? Can, we, can you hear? Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, what? I'm sorry, I, I almost don't remember the question anymore. What was the question? <laughs> How can individuals that are quarantining with each other right now improve their communication patterns to, to work on decreasing yes. the domestic okay. violence outbursts? Right. So here's how couples can improve their communication. Um, I want to give you some specific skills because it's easy to just say improve the communication and stuff like that, but it you can't do what you don't know. So embrace taking a time out. I like to tell my couples, put a pen in it, right? So if you feel heart is racing, um, you're flooding, you you just feel very angry, it seems like this is going to go nowhere, right? Take take a break. Mm-hmm. Take a time out. Step away from one another because no one can engage in persuasion until both of you can state your own position, but more importantly, state your partner's position, on what it is that's occurring, right? So you want to slow uh-huh. down and try to help your partner to stay in a what's wrong mode as opposed to a what, what the hell is wrong, right? So you want to take turns being the speaker and the listener. Whoever is the speaker, no blaming, and i I actually, let me give everybody a second to jot this down. So grab a pen and paper, right? So as the speaker, one, no blaming. You don't get to blame. No you statements. You did this. You did that. If you would have just dot, 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 right? So no blaming, no you statements. Talk about your feelings. Use only I statements about a specific situation, right? So you just Uh want to use I statements about specific facts, right? Um, I felt, for example, um, I felt dismissed when, uh, when no one paid attention to, um, how hard I worked on, cleaning up after the kids or whatever the situation is, right? So we're going to use I statements about specific situations. State a positive need. So with every complaint, there is a, with every complaint, you need like um, like, like a, a recipe for a solution. So So something positive that you need. Something that is a realistic thing that they can do to improve the situation. That's for the speaker. For the listener, you want to postpone your own agenda, right? Because what happens is when people are talking, at some point we tune out to what they're saying because we have our own agenda and we want to hurry up and jump in and state our point or defend ourselves. Resist the urge to do that. What you want to do is be able to hear and repeat the content of what the speaker has said. So after your partner has said all the things they've said, 
you need to, in your own words, state back to them what it is you heard them saying. Okay? Hear the speaker's feelings and name the emotions, right? So it sounds like you feel very frustrated. It sounds like that really hurt your feelings. It sounds like you are um, uh, distraught, all right? So whatever the emotion is, name it. Um, And then you want to validate them, okay? That's the last step. So validation, and this is very important, validation doesn't necessarily mean agreement. You Just because you hear and you understand, it doesn't necessarily mean that you agree, but what you are doing is telling your partner that I understand what you're saying. And a lot of times that's what we really want, is that we want to know that you hear us and you understand us, okay? And so you want to validate the speaker by restating back to them what it is you heard, letting them know that you understand why they would feel that way and why they might have those needs, okay? Again, even though you understand it, it doesn't necessarily mean you agree, but you're letting them know that you understand, right? So that's it, listening and validation. And then you know what? You can take a break and then come back again and switch roles. So now the person who was the speaker becomes the listener, and the person who was the listener becomes the speaker. Now, this is only a part of the conflict blueprint, but I think this is at least an opportunity for people to be able to slow down and listen to one another and de-escalate some of these situations and improve communication. Fatima, that was so eloquently stated for anybody that had any thoughts about going to couples counseling and wondering how could it help improve how my mate and I communicate, what does it look like? I think that that was a blueprint to what that process looks like when you're in a session. Um, And even though it doesn't happen overnight, it's the process that takes place and they're continuing to practice that and so they're able to implement that until it becomes an automatic process, and that's how they change and improve their communication style. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, Today, you guys, we wanted to just bring to people's awareness domestic violence and um, to make sure that people are doing the things that they can do during this particular time Um, to stay as healthy as they can, and not just physically, but emotionally, um, spiritually, all of the above. And so, um, Renee Gura, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you have a lot of things um, going on, and and you're you're doing telehealth, so if individuals are seeking out couples therapy, um, how can they reach you? Um, They can contact me at um, 214-253-9534. I I will say, though, at the moment, and this is just for the moment, but at the moment I am not accepting any new clients, uh, but that could change in the next couple of weeks. So you can call me. I do have a waiting list, um, and and we're trying our best to work through it um, as quickly as possible. Um, Or they can go to my website, which is www.crenegreer.com. And Renee, are you do you have any more process loops coming up soon or you haven't um decided on the dates yet that's to come? Listen, I I really enjoyed your vibe last night. I enjoyed uh I believe you said Dr. Rahim was there. Um he dropped mm-hmm. nuggets as well. I think this is something that we need to keep keep doing. It's definitely um spare the moment for me. You know, it was not something that I had planned and I kinda like it that way. You know, I like it. I like mm-hmm. it in the way that we just kind of come together, and so I think it's something that that we we will do again. And I definitely want to um, welcome you to come anytime because it, it was awesome, as well as Dr. Raheem. It, it was awesome. So yeah, I think this is something that maybe and we'll talk about it, Dr. Guy. But maybe we should do um, every Saturday or at least sometime um, every during the week. I don't know. We'll work on it. Uh, absolutely. Just keep me posted, and and we'll keep the listeners. 
um, up to date on when the next time that you do it. Because um, I, I definitely thought not only was it helpful for me to participate, but I really got a lot out of hearing um, the different um, responses from people that were sharing yesterday. Um, as mm -hmm. we begin to uh, wrap up our Resurrection Sunday, um, Fatima, do you have any takeaways? I mean, I know you just dropped several nuggets just now, but is there any other last takeaways that you would like our listeners to, to know before we leave? Yeah, some takeaways. Um, I uh, One of the things that I tell couples or if I'm seeing someone who appears to be a domestic violence situation, the first thing we talk about is making a safety plan, right? Because sometimes if you just try to leave, that could be even more dangerous. So I would encourage people to make a safety plan, right? So um, try to get all of your important documents together with them. Um, uh -huh. Have Hello? Uh-huh. We're here for Tina. Okay. Uh, have someone that you trust um, to have those or keep those in a safe place for you. Um, also, I would encourage people, if you are listening to this show, and, this show and, and you are questioning and a little unsure about whether or not you are in a domestic violence situation, um, I'm going to list out some things that might help you figure that out. So person always wants to isolate you from friends or family, uh, if they tend to insult or belittle you, even, even when joking, if they blame others a lot, and oftentimes it's you, if alcohol and drug use that uh, if that causes erratic behavior and that can be a catalyst for the abuse, if they instill fear or uneasiness, or if they're intimidating in their speech or their actions, if they punish you or retaliate for time you spend away from them, if they expect you to be subservient but aren't helpful themselves, if they are extremely jealous of your time, relationships, and aspirations, if they manipulate your emotions and make you feel guilty, or if they get physical. Obviously, hitting someone is abusive, but physical abuse can start as intimidating posture, grabbing, pushing, or controlling your movements and space. So if you feel like any of those ring true about your relationship, then I would encourage you to get on the Google machine and um, look up signs of abusive relationships, and I'm sure if you do that, that will lead you to other information about getting help and possibly getting out. Um, I think it's also important to note that, um, you know, some people think that, uh, you know, it's just a little hitting or something like that, but I I have to say that 60 to 80% of intimate partner homicides, no matter which partner was killed, the man physically abused the woman before the murder. Okay? So I think that for your safety, the safety of your children, if you have any, um, and this is for men and women, important to try to be in safer situations, and it does not mean that things can't improve, but it's important to separate from the violence until you both can get the therapy that you need. Well, thank you very much, Fatima. Uh, Steve, any closing <clears throat> remarks for today? Um, I could give it a shot. Um, it's kind of hard coming behind all of you wonderful <laughs> clinicians with your education because everything that, that I know is totally opposite. Um, 
you know, for those men out there who are out there dealing with those emotional terrorists or wildebeest or hyenas, like I call them, the hyena pack or the wildebeest pack, you know, and you feel like you threatened, man, just date submissive women. Just, just get away from them, you know. And, you know, I don't, I ain't never killed any of my partners, but I done spanked a few, and I just like the way their ass shake. I, I ain't that serious to me. Um, so, <laughs> so I can't, I can't speak to any of, any of some of this stuff, you know. And 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 if you ain't never been in a relationship, and you said you was going somewhere, and your girl blocked the door, I don't think you're in a bad relationship. That's just me. Um, you're gonna have some of these elements. It's just you know you have to be able to decipher you know what is a problem and what is not you know you can spank somebody with the front of your hand but when you start turning the back of your hand and hitting them with that that's something else so um you know just be careful uh be be cognizant of patterns uh you know like like you, you know we talked about the isolation you know that can just be you not spend enough time i don't know um you know just date be cool be respectful you know um like I said, mind mind those patterns, you know, and learn how to fight fair, you know. Like I said, if I got three toes and I left the toilet seat up, don't call me a three toe sucker. Just tell me I ain't leave the toilet seat down, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's that's basically. I'm just a common man trying to give some common common advice. You know, I don't know about all of the statistics and whatnot, but you know, ain't nobody ever put their hands on me. Well, that one time, but we won't talk about that. But for the most part, you know, you know we're in a bad situation. <laughs> you know, we had to, I, you know, I, we, don't, we don't talk about that. <laughs> and she's a little slow, but, you know, we forgive her for that. Okay. Well, I always appreciate your commentary and Fatima as well. Um, and so, you guys, I do just want to leave you all, if you know someone or if you're in a situation that um, you feel is harmful, um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline number is 1-800-799-7233. Again, that's 1-800-799-7233. And um, just because these are unprecedented times for all of us, um, people just need someone to talk to. So if you are in crisis um, and you need additional information about where to get resources from, um, you can go to the crisis textline.org website um, and get more information um, to help you deal with whatever it is you might be experiencing um, during these times. With that being said, you guys, thank you all for this discussion today. Um, don't forget to tweet it, text it, tell a friend, Facebook it about Dr. Guy Scumbo Talk. Everybody enjoy the rest of your Resurrection Sunday. Be blessed. Talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.